Hello and welcome to TV on TV. I'm State Representative Tommy Vitolo. You're watching Brookline Interactive Group, and today is Thursday, May 27th. We've got a great show. We're going to be interviewing Jonathan Golden, who is a citizen member, not a commissioner of the CDICR, that's uh, Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Relations. He's also a board member of BIG, Brookline Interactive Group, and he's a TMM, a town meeting member. And those three things swirl around public participation, particularly in local government. So that's what we're going to talk about, uh, how that changed during COVID, what parts of it we're going to, we might be able to keep post-COVID. Uh, it's a really interesting conversation. I hope you'll stay tuned. That was filmed two days ago at my state house office. I was at the office. He was at his home. And so the background will change. Don't be alarmed. You may also notice that this is a virtual background. If I wave my hand fast, it looks funny. Uh, my wife and I had a schedule conflict. She's in the home office right now. I'm filming uh, somewhere else with a fake background. But, you know, it's COVID, it's Zoom, it's public television. We're flexible. Uh, but I want to, before we talk with Jonathan Golden, I do want to go through some news. There's actually quite a bit, including some international news, which I don't normally cover. Uh, two things. First, uh, Egypt has successfully brokered a ceasefire between Hamas and Israel, and that's fabulous news for the people who live in Israel and the people who live in Gaza. And there's been a few skirmishes or, or, or scuffles. I don't know what the right uh, appropriate foreign policy word is, but for the most part, it's held uh, and it's really optimistic. Uh, another form, another place for optimism is around climate change, where yesterday four different things happened that are actually individually pretty remarkable. The first is that a court in the Netherlands ordered Royal Dutch Shell to dramatically cut its emissions over the next decade. Uh, it cannot meet those requirements without changing its business model. Chevron shareholders with a 61% majority uh, voted to uh, require the company cut its scope three emissions. And those are the emissions essentially of its customers, right? The customers who burn gasoline or fuel, oil for heating, for power plants, and so forth, um, they've got to cut their emissions, and that's a big deal. Finally, um, ExxonMobil announced that shareholders had elected two candidates to the company's board over ExxonMobil's strenuous objections because these two uh, new board members are pushing for climate action. Finally, Australia uh, ruled in favor of some young people uh, who are arguing that Australia's policies around energy and environment um, and therefore their contribution to climate change uh, are illegal because they are um, taking away from these young people's positive and healthy future. Uh, so all four things happened yesterday. Um, the ramifications will take time to ripple through. I think they will be significant and I think it is um, important because in the case of these shareholder actions with both Chevron and Exxon, that wasn't uh, Sisters of the Poor voting 61%. You know, the, the nonprofits and the Catholic charities and others who own small amounts of shares, of course, they uh, lined up in favor as well. But to get to 61%, the major institutional investors had to vote that way. And that's some combination of pension funds, but also you know, Blackstone Group, these, these very, very wealthy institutions that hold the money of wealthy persons and wealthy individuals voted this, which means either uh, wealthy people really um, are coming to terms with climate change, but maybe also really wealthy people are coming to terms with the rest of us are coming to terms with climate change, and therefore they need to evolve their businesses or they will die. Uh, and that's really exciting and that's really interesting. Um, it'll be a bumpy road ahead, but I am optimistic that these corporations will uh, get with the program. And that's really exciting. There's other news too. I guess I got to talk about it, uh, running out of time. But look, uh, this week was the one year anniversary of George Floyd's murder. That was Tuesday. And uh, the US Congress is working on legislation, the George Floyd Justice in Policing Act, which will do a number of things that state law uh, was adjusted for last year, like banning chokeholds. Um, the federal bill would also end qualified immunity as we know it. Um, but unless they get 10 votes in the Senate, it's not gonna move. Um, the CDC federally continues to recommend masks 
for those who are not vaccinated and those who are not able to keep distance. And so if you're vaccinated, um, as you know, starting on the 29th, starting on uh, Saturday, uh, the mask requirement will be gone in most places, as will the rest of the COVID restrictions in Massachusetts uh, due to Governor Baker's actions. You will still need to wear masks when riding Uber and Lyft or the MBTA or an RTA, but for the most part, uh, masks will only be required when the building occupant requires them. If the grocery store mandates it, you still got to do it. Uh, if, if you're visiting your friend's house and your friend says, put the mask on, you got to put the mask on. And if you want to wear a mask, of course, you still can. Locally, town meeting continues. We've had three nights so far. We voted a budget. Um, we voted against creating a local historic district by a razor thin margin. Um, there's more coming, including possibly a revote on that local historic district, uh, which is, is uh, on Kent Street um, near Longwood Avenue is the easiest way to describe it. And other town meeting actions as well to come. Uh, additionally, if you're a D-line rider, heads up uh, Saturday, June 12th to Sunday, June 20th. And then again, Thursday, June 24th to Friday, July 2nd, the D-line is not running um, and there will be shuttle service from Riverside to Kenmore. So plan around that. Without further ado, I really want to get to this interview with Jonathan Golden, a, not a commissioner, but a, a participant in CDICR and a Brookline big board member and town meeting member. So let's cut right over to that. And uh, thanks for watching. Stay tuned. And as promised today, we've got Golden as our guest. And you may notice uh, we don't have the normal background. Instead of using a virtual background, I figured to let you know where I am. I'm at the State House, and uh, I'm here because there are a couple of things I need to take care of downtown and a few things I need to get done in the building. And thought, why not see uh, my office? You can see there's a, I guess over, over here, there's the flag of Brooklyn. And over here, there's the map of, of the district of Brookline uh, that I represent, which is most of Brookline by population, uh, if not by land area. Uh, Jonathan, though, thanks, thanks for coming on the show today. It's a pleasure. It's an honor to be here. Thank you. And just to give folks a little bit of heads up, I think we're going to you know, chat about a couple of things today. I think we're going to talk maybe about the CDICR. I think we'll talk about uh, BIG. I think we'll talk about open meetings a little bit. But first, Jonathan, what folks really want to know is, what have you been up to from birth until about now? So I'm a native of Massachusetts. I grew up in Worcester, where my parents still live. And I only left the state for college, went to Princeton undergrad as a history major, and also was part of the teacher preparation program to become a history teacher. I decided to go back to grad school, and that's what brought me back to Boston. And actually to Brookline, it was at Hebrew College when it was on the Haas Street campus for two years, and then Brandeis for a PhD. And I'm, but I moved to Brookline permanently to live in 1999, so I've been here 22 years. And since in that time, I've been working at Gann Academy as a history teacher. Uh, where And the reason I decided to become an American history teacher is I wanted students to be prepared to, to participate in democracy. It's the idea from John Dewey, the great American educational philosopher. And uh, it's something I've taught for many years, but realized in recent years I hadn't done it as much myself. And that's what has brought me to Brookline and more involved in Brookline politics in recent years. And, and I'm delighted you've gotten involved, right? You've gotten involved both on the appointed side, sort of the, the volunteer side, and you've gotten yourself elected. So tell us a little bit about town meeting quickly, but then I want you to pivot right into uh, the appointed side where frankly, there's many more opportunities for our community to be involved uh, and where we have tremendous opportunity to- Thanks. So. I'm lucky to know a lot of people in town meeting who've encouraged me to get involved. And I want to speak just for a moment about the circumstances. I think about a year ago as COVID hit, but also you know, today we're here in the one year anniversary of the murder of George Floyd. And both of them were, were moments for me to think about, I've been teaching students for years about getting involved in democracy, but what am I doing myself? So I reached out to a lot of my friends who are, have been involved in town meeting and they said, you should really look at boards and commissions. And I started by, to, I went to the website to see what was possible. And I saw there were a lot of opportunities uh, involved with the Commission on Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Relations. Met Joan Lancourt, who's the chair of the committee, 
And she told me about this new committee called the Community Engagement Committee, which is about how to get people more involved in politics. And I thought, well, this is what I've been teaching. It's time to practice what I preach. And I really wanted to give back in that way to my community. And how that ties to town meeting is, I have been encouraged in, in previous years. I've been following the Driscoll School story as a Driscoll School parent. I am a first grader for many years. I remember when I was engaged my wife a decade ago, and they said, oh, just don't worry, a couple of years from now, there's gonna be a new Driscoll School. And here we are, we're only about to break ground next month, and I'm thankful for that. And I got, as I got involved in the override uh, vote for that and more involved in town, um, and being on this committee, I finally felt like I understood town government a bit better, met some more people, and that's what encouraged me finally to run in Precinct 11. And I feel really lucky to be in a neighborhood that prioritizes community engagement. And there are great people who have been mentors to me already, who have had me precinct meetings, um, and especially when they've taken full advantage of Zoom remotely for the opportunity for people in our neighborhood to talk about issues of concern uh, to them, whether that is about the Driscoll School or the Warren articles coming up or anything of concern. And I'm gonna really feel lucky to be part of this new, this new cohort. So I've, I was just elected in May and it's my first town meeting the past uh, last week and looking forward to the meetings upcoming this week. And has town meeting been everything you had dreamed of and more? It has, it's been wonderful to see in person because I did watch it last year on big and had a chance to get a feel for what it was like. And I was really interested by the last meeting in particular the opportunity for town meeting members to ask any question they had about the budget. Because I really think a budget is about priorities. And it was an opportunity to hear what are the priorities of my fellow town meeting members, both ones which I knew from the questioners, some they've been working on for a long time, especially over this year, but ones are also committed to, to working on moving forward. So I, I found that a really fascinating process. And I know we have some big discussions to come, especially on short-term rentals. Is that a fascinating discussion this week? And I know later in our discussion, we'll get to talking about big, where I should name, I recently became a board member of Big uh, uh, just a few months ago. And Big, as I mentioned in an op-ed I wrote in the tab last week, has really been a teacher for me about book on politics. And, and uh, I think shows like yours, the election night coverage, select board meetings, school committee, I don't know how the past 15 months of town government would have been possible without Big. So um, my joining the Big Board was also a way to give back to them. Well, we're going to get to that, but I do want to, um, you know, we, we tease the CDICR and I, and I do want to give you a chance to make some meaningful comments about about that group um that committee and um what it's been working on but more importantly sort of how you see the role of the cdicr in the next year or two to come how will that organization that committee shape our town so i'm part of a subcommittee of the cdicr called the community engagement committee and that's committed to helping residents of brookline understand town government better and understand how they can be involved. And I joined the committee last June and it was one of the best experiences I could have had personally in terms of my own education. Each week at each meeting, we invited a different town department to talk about how are the engaging town residents? What are their priorities? How are they listening to the priorities of residents? And how does that shape their decision-making? So I give as a wonderful example of the, the work that Erin Gallantine is working doing at the Department of Public Works. And I know she recently had a, a community engagement meeting just back on May 12th. And I, I think back to the meeting that we had with her in the summer where she talked and laid out what were her priorities and thinking through with us what would be a, a good way to help to engage residents in areas of concern, what the priorities of any particular department should be. So over the past year, we engaged more departments to think about how can they set community engagement goals by which they hear the input of residents of what their needs are and how they'll shape their planning going forward. I think in the coming year, we really need to focus much more on the community, community organizations to figure out what do residents need? How do they wanna learn more about how town government works? So we're currently, we've drafted a community bill of rights, which looks at what are things that we think every resident should have in terms of understanding how the process works, how to find out about meetings, how to get their voice heard, how to hear about how decisions are made. And over the coming year, we'll be meeting more in our meetings with different community organizations. Very logically, we started with the League of Women Voters, who does terrific, and they do terrific work around community engagement, whether or not election time, Warren article review, as they've done, to think about how can we amplify the work they're doing and continue to partner together in other ways to get people involved. And I think we'll be doing more meetings like that. We meet every other week, Friday mornings, 8.30 to 9.30. If anyone in the audience wants to join us, they're certainly welcome to, to share their views on community engagement. And our goal is just to think together about how can we bring a diverse set of voices into important town conversations. So when we talk about a diverse set of voices, uh, I'm curious if you can put some, sort of fill in that a little bit for us. 
Um, obviously, on the one year anniversary of George Floyd's murder uh, today, when we're filming it Tuesday, not not when we're showing it a few days from now. Um, folks are thinking about racial diversity, but can you tell us sort of a little more about the, the ways that um, your subcommittee is thinking about diversity and if you want to go a little farther, which, which groups of people um, maybe you think uh, their perspectives or their voices or their views aren't um, being, being perceived as clearly or as loudly as maybe to uh, be. So we're lucky to live in this uh, town form of government, I think, and I think it will prove its model the best as possible over the coming uh, years. And I would say this in particular in terms of the time of COVID, that more people have been able to access so many of the meetings because of the work of big, because of re remote meetings and the possibility to, to have access. So certainly race is very important. We've had important discussions this community this year, both the work of reimagining uh, policing and the reform committee have led to important conversations about how race plays out in that way. But I also think about people who in the past may not have been able to attend town meetings for simple reason of when the time of the meeting was held, work responsibilities they had, childcare, which made it difficult for them to travel to other places. And I think as simple as that, having more ways to allow anyone who wants to access and either attend a committee meeting, comment on a select board meeting, give comment as many did to school committee and so many of the other forum that we have in Brookline, that that's an important part of what we're trying to do is really to, to see, can we make government is accessible to as many people as possible and have their views be informed by the, the work and the priorities of departments going forward. So definitely I think about that in terms of race, I certainly think about it in terms of class, but also just accessibility. Think about different stages of life, about how uh, we've had it, the inspirational work of so many high school students I saw involved in many of the campaigns this time, and some are looking at um, other forms of government. I know in the charter question to come, so one group certainly I would love to have high school students involved. It speaks to my heart as a high school educator. Um, but uh, I'm really open, and I think this next year, the work of our committee will be trying to identify and bring into the process any other stakeholder groups who would like to be more involved. So I want to I want to pivot a little bit from there. Um, I think I want to talk about about the meetings first, and then we'll end on big, which has really stitched uh, a lot of this together. And so under the state of emergency and under the sort of COVID acts of the legislature, uh, the rules regarding how public meetings operate were, uh, you could say loosened, you could say expanded, you could certainly say changed, right? And so for example, uh, boards and committees were meeting 100% virtually, uh, going back to something like March or April of 2020, and legally that comes to an end on June 15th when the state of emergency expires. And at that point, we revert back to the pre-COVID uh, set of rules, which allows for a minority, 49% of a board committee or commission to so long as the a quorum, including the chair, is physically present. Um, and it does not allow for any virtual or hybrid representative town meeting. And, and some folks are saying, I think you as well, hey, there was some real value to, uh, to the virtual meetings. And so can you talk us through what are the parts of virtual meeting um, that the status quo from prior to COVID doesn't allow for that are really worth holding on to? Absolutely. Uh, I was happy to sign on to a letter with a number of other town meeting members being sent to the select board. And Again, we're taping on Tuesday, so there'll be a meeting tonight with I think some of that will be discussed. Well, we believe in terms of accessibility, I think that's the key word here, how to make town government accessible to as many people as possible. So I think of something like the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, the opportunity that people who may not have been able to travel to meetings before, Zoom allows them to be in the room where it happens, to, to listen to important conversation, to voice if there's an opportunity for public comment, or at least to follow the conversation if they want. And I think there's been tremendous power in that. As I understand, again, I'm a new town meeting member, but I understand that we've, there's been better attendance in some of these town meetings than, than past ones, higher voting percentage, and that, that's just among town meeting members. And I think about all the possibilities of building on the good work and the infrastructure that's been built over the past year for meetings and for, for comment. Now, certainly I do hope to return to the day where I will be able to be in person with others soon. I think 
I, I'm not saying that everything should be entirely remote, but any way uh, that we can make government more accessible to people, that's something that's always been a passion of mine, the work I do with the CDICR, and I'm proud to share that you know, commitment with many other town meeting members. So I'm hopeful that the state uh, will allow for there to be an extension of a town meeting and other meetings to be, to happen um, remotely to really build on the sense of engagement that I see and I felt has built over this year that more people have been uh, thinking globally but acting lo locally and I hope that will continue. Yeah, and so and so just to remind our viewers, uh, there's nothing that precludes uh, local government from offering or requiring its boards and committees to accept virtual public comment. Right. Right. The select board, uh, advisory committee, subcommittees, any any meeting that is accepting public comment uh, already has the authority to accept that comment virtually, either by telephone, by something like Zoom, and of course. Um, in addition to in-person and, and written communications, which, which has also been the status quo. Uh, where it gets tricky is when more than half of the board committee or commission would prefer to be virtual, or when even one town meeting member in a representative town meeting would prefer to be virtual. I, and as, as you know, I filed a bill to extend the ability to do virtual town meeting um, past the end of the state of emergency, roughly actually by 75 days with the thinking that if a town is scheduled a representative town meeting and then the governor removes the state of emergency, we wouldn't want that town to be stuck in terms of scheduling. And maybe that bill will move between now and June 15th, maybe it won't. The governor today, you and I were discussing uh, before we came on, uh, made a, a similar proposal. Uh, I don't know if he, he read my bill or not, um, but he suggested allowing public bodies to meet in open sessions remotely uh, September 1. And of course, the governor doesn't have the authority to implement that. That um, requires maybe the attorney general, possibly it requires the legislature. And I don't know if we're going to see that. Um, but certainly there remains some ability to be um, digital. And the question sort of becomes, you know, what, what's the town going to do that? the towns and then will the state uh, act to expand in a way that um, expands opportunity without restricting or creating new challenges I will tell you um, my understanding of the reason why the open meeting law today requires a majority in person including the chair uh, and this was actually a, a decision or determination made by then Attorney General Martha Coakley is that if the technology fails, in the middle of a meeting, you still have a quorum. You can continue to do business. The meeting still counts. If you don't have a majority in person, if the technology fails for any reason, there's sort of this open question, well, now what happens to the meeting? Is the whole meeting null and void? Is it only up to that point valid? Is the whole thing valid even without a quorum? Right, what, whose fault is it and who can be held responsible? Right, so there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of questions that I suspect the legislature and the attorney general will wanna have some better understanding of before moving forward, which puts us at odds, right? We want government to be very fast and effective, but also to get it right uh, and to do it on the cheap. And that's not so easy, I will say, as a legislator. Um, right. I can tell you that in terms of, of salaries, we're, we're doing it on the cheap. Um, but I digress. Um, and, and so um, could you imagine, uh, I guess I would ask it this way, um, are there one or two or three things in particular that go beyond what we just described with the open meeting law and virtual town meeting? You would say are like the things that provide the most value um, incrementally, right? We want it all, but if you had to say, well, here's the one or the two changes that I think are the most important um, what would those be? In terms of uh, meeting or town meeting of sort of um, using technology to expand accessibility. Um, look, I would largely say I'd want to build on the successes that I've seen in the meetings that have, that have happened thus far. So, uh, and I appreciate, first of all, I appreciate the support that you mentioned, the bill that you filed. I appreciate also that you, you've named the things that one needs to balance, which is the technology, cost, and efficiency. All those need, need to be put into balance. 
it seems to me that my ultimate goal is that we figure out what's the best way to engage people in our community. So some of that may come through the town meeting itself. You know, another area of work that the CDICR committee I'm on is looking at is the website. And our website actually gets a redesign every three years. And that three-year redesign is up the end of this uh, calendar year, 2021. So we've been in conversation already with IT to do an audit to think about in what ways is the website actually suiting the needs of giving people up-to-date information about meetings and meeting minutes and other ways that it can serve our residents and in what ways might we improve? And they've really been wonderful partners in thinking through that issue with us. So I think that's another area of technology and focus I'm hoping that's going to be on the radar screen for Brookline in the coming year and that we look for, we'll definitely be having some meetings probably of the summer and beyond with IT about that and hoping to be part of that process of design the website to be maximally um, efficient and effective for Brookline residents. Yeah, and I think you're you're right to focus on the website. You know, the the town budget allocated for working on this is inadequate, right? That that our staff are working really hard on this, but things things are evolving in our government in all sorts of complicated ways, and keeping up is not so easy. To say nothing of um, that's just keeping up with a little information like who's on what committee and what time uh, the library is open and those sorts of that or the picture redesigns as we learn how to use technology differently and and you know as more and more people are looking at a website on this instead of on a web browser right it requires really a totally different design to to be effective and so i'm glad to hear uh that you're working on that and i hope that uh town meeting will continue to support uh the staff and the budget necessary to do that and speaking of town meeting supporting budget necessary for technology to communicate and engage with the community. Let's talk about Brookline Interactive Group. Huh? How is that for a transition? Excellent. Tell us about the, the tell us about the Warren article. Tell us about the resolution uh, on the warrant that town meeting will be thinking about next week. Let's let's start there. Sure. So when I first appeared for the big board to be a prospective board member, I told them they I think they were the some of the unsung heroes of this entire year. Think of all the meetings that they broadcast for this community. It really kept us together in some of the most important conversations about COVID, about our schools, select board discussions, policing, et cetera. And they've, they've been doing terrific work and the demands have increased over 200% of the kind of work they're doing, not only for government, but also a lot of worship services were there, classes, um, ways in which they've connected to the high school through the years. But their big challenge is the funding challenge, that they rely on subscriber fees from cable. And many have cut the cord, um, gone to other services where they're not paying the subscriber fees. And a big recognized this before COVID, but it's, it's becoming more and more acute as uh, this upcoming year, a shortfall of $125,000 for their budget, a tremendous amount of their budget and given the imports that they have. So there's a very important Warren Article 40 that's before uh, town meeting this time, which is to look at creating a study committee. What are some future uh, sources of funding that we can explore to keep big as the viable community media center that it is for our community. And the idea would be to form that study committee uh, to bring back its findings a year from now in the spring and really hope for a number of alternative uh, sources of funding. Some of that may come from beyond Brookline. I'm hoping there'll be some advocacy at the state level and perhaps at the federal level for this, but really to think creatively of how we can fund, which I, and I describe it as much as in my house, when I think about big and all the meetings I watch, it's like, Turning on the light or turning on the water faucet, it's a utility, it's something I expect, and I think that we all need in terms of access to government. And I'm really hoping for a resounding support for Article Warren Article 40 from the entire town meeting to show our appreciation for the tremendous work that, that Big has done, which I would recognize by some funding by Select Board over the course of COVID, but really moving forward to keep it viable. It's gonna require a community effort to study together. How can we keep the funding sources viable for it? I think there's there's sort of a parallel to the MBTA here, right? The MBTA is funded by a variety of sources, and one of those sources is user fees, is fares. And then when COVID hit, the fare receipts dropped to nearly zero, and all of a sudden the T didn't have any money anymore because it was relying on a funding stream that it turns out was not sustainable under all circumstances. And now ownership is climbing. The green line is back to about. 30%. Um, some buses in the blue line are, are, have crossed 50%, right? But but if you rely on funding that can disappear uh, and you still have structural costs, 
uh, you've got a problem. And that's similar to the problem that, that Big is facing, where uh, one of its most fundamental sources of funding is eroding at a time when, you know, look, in addition to the inflationary costs, right, you, equipment gets more and more expensive, staff deserve pay raises. Uh, the town is asking Big to do more and more. And so finding some funding uh, is key. I hope you'll include county government on your list of places where you look under the couch cushions for coins. Um, I think there's some opportunities there as well. Uh, and to uh, work with the committee, I certainly can't serve on it and create that conflict, um, but I'm happy to work with it. So, um, so how much money are we talking about? Like what? How much money does Big get from the town now, and what would a reasonable increase be? So what I know, I don't have the exact dollar amount. I, I know that Big gets two percent of the subscriber fees currently that come to the town. Uh, that five percent come, two percent go to Big, and three percent go um, to the town itself. Um, so I, I mean, my sense is that's some of what the study committee will need to look at for the exact dollar amount to be asked. That, Really, that this particular Warren article is resolution for us to, to, to look, I think, strategically together for the amount that people will need. Um, and, and I'm very glad that you made the MBTA analogy because certainly another hit that Big took during COVID, Big was doing incredible classes about media and Zoom and virtual reality. And that's that's an income stream that's been lost in this time that and Big was really was building up a wonderful clientele for that, which I hope I will return. So um, my sense is all together. Hopefully we will study and find out what is that uh, the sweet spot in terms of what the revenue should be. Well, folks, if you're if you're watching us, you're watching us on Big. You're watching us on Brookline Interactive Group, and that is our uh, community multimedia uh, public access programming. And uh, you know, there's lots of ways you can be involved. You can actually become a card carrying member. I am one of those, uh, but you need not be. Uh, you're welcome to though. Uh, the big facilities uh, are starting to open again, as, as with the rest of society. Uh, and I encourage you, if you have any interest in content creation, uh, you can call me directly or you can reach out to Jonathan. You can reach out to anyone at Big. Um, it's really a lot of fun. Uh, you don't have to come in with, with any sort of knowledge or experience to get started. Uh, and, and I would join you, Jonathan, in saying that um, one of the, the glues that held our community together over the last 15 or 16 months is big. And I, um, my gratitude is big for that. And Jonathan, I know yours is as well. Uh, Jonathan, I wanna thank you for coming on the show. And, uh, and uh, you know, you're, you're welcome to write about uh, TV on TV in, in, in the hometown paper anytime you like. Uh, we appreciate the shout out and uh, a shout out to you for um, recognizing that um, you could live up to the values you were teaching uh, and stepping into the trenches and really working to improve our community. So thank you. Thank you for that, Jonathan. And I want to thank you, Tommy, for how you model community engagement in this community, the show like this, making your phone number always available. It's, it's a wonderful model of public service. So thanks for all you do. Well, thanks, everyone. Jonathan, uh, we'll see you at town meeting virtually. And uh, we'll see you in media, all sorts of different ways. Everyone, you've been watching TV on TV on BIG. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.